the mind is not a blank slate. It's not even a slate with writing all over it. It's not even a full teacup. It's more active. It feeds. It goes out, looks for things, tries ingesting them. It shapes its experience, which is why you can't simply give it a meditation technique regardless of its background, regardless of its values, and hope that each mind will take the same technique and get the same results. This is why the Buddha didn't just teach a technique of meditation. He taught a whole culture for training the mind. And if we want to get the most advantage out of his teachings, we have to look at the whole culture. We call it the customs of the noble ones. There's a discourse where he talks about these customs. The first three have to do with being content. Content with whatever food you get, whatever clothing you get, whatever shelter you get. In other words, content with your circumstances, your physical circumstances. Realizing the, the fact that you have a body here breathing. You've got all you really need. And if your circumstances provide you with enough food to keep on breathing, enough clothing and shelter to breathe in good health, you've really got enough. And it goes on beyond just contentment to realizing the fact that as we depend on these things, we can tend to get attached. There is a danger there. There's also the danger on the other side where you are very proud of the fact that you can get along with just very little. You look down on other people who are not so frugal as you are. That's a danger, too. And so you learn how to use these things and avoid the various dangers that surround them. The Buddha wants you to be content in terms of these things because in the fourth training it's more active. He says it's delighting in abandoning and delighting in developing, i.e. delighting in activities, training the mind to do things in a skillful way, abandoning unskillful habits and developing skillful ones in their place. The delight there is important. It means that your values support you in this practice. We were talking earlier today about the practice of merit and how here in the West it's very difficult for us to pick up on that idea. And yet it's probably one of the most important ones to learn to get into, to try on. And then see what good things it can do for the mind. We tend to dislike it because, as we said, it sounds like brownie points, Girl Scout badges. Boy Scout badges. You're trying to chalk, chalk up points someplace. <clears throat> but that's not the case. As the Buddha said, acts of merit are another word for happiness. That's important to think about. It's not just the feeling you get from them that's happiness. It's the actual action is a kind of happiness. We don't think of happiness as an action. It's a feeling we get from doing things. But here we're saying the actual activity. You exercise an activity that feels good, that feels right. And in that, in the action itself, is the happiness. That right there is a lot to think about. But the Buddha doesn't want you just to think about it. He wants you to do the actions, to see for yourself. And this is why it's important that you have a sense of the value of doing good things, of being generous, being virtuous, developing thoughts of goodwill. 
that phrase for the Sankatan, the gifts given to the Sangha. At the very end it says, please may you, the Sangha accept this for our long-term welfare and happiness, i.e. so that we can do the act of merit and find the happiness in that action. It doesn't mean you have to give things only to the Sangha. As the Buddha once said, there is no should in giving. When King Basanity asked him, where should a gift be given, the Buddha said, wherever you feel inspired. And the monks are told that when someone asks them, where should I give this gift I have, the monks should say, well, wherever you feel inspired or feel that it would be well used or well taken care of. In other words, it's up to you where you feel inspired to give. But in the acting, that's the important thing, finding the goodness in the action. And you'll find that if you give gifts to places where you feel that they're well used, there's even greater happiness. There's happiness in the planning, there's happiness in the actual giving itself, and there's happiness when you reflect on it afterwards, which is very different from other kinds of happiness. The happiness that comes from experiencing, say, a sensual pleasure. Sometimes there's a lot of agitation as you try to strive for that sensual pleasure. And then even as you're experiencing it, it's slipping out of your grasp. And then when it's done, it's gone. You can't call it back. You can call back the memory, but there's no guarantee that the memory of those kinds of pleasures is going to be pleasant memory. Sometimes there's a lot of regret, either, either over the fact that that pleasure is gone, or you start thinking about some of the things you did to get that pleasure. Not necessarily good memories, but the memory of doing something you know is good. You look back on it, yes, I did that, I accomplished that, and the happiness was in the doing. Now that it's done, there's a happiness that stays. And this is for your long-term welfare and happiness, is to value these acts. This is where our culture is really lacking. You get the general culture. Basic idea is that there's a lot of strife and there's a lot of conflict. The newspapers thrive on conflict. If everybody were at peace, you couldn't sell a newspaper, except for the Sudokus and the comics. And so they try to stir up as much controversy as possible. They thrive on that. And there are other people who thrive on conflict, try to keep it all stirred up. And the image is that we cannot live in peace with one another. It's either them or us. And the idea of a happiness that spreads around, a happiness that's shared, gets trampled. The people who do good are the, are the fools. That's the attitude of the culture. You've got to fight for yourself. It's, uh, it's interesting that the people who don't believe in Darwinism do believe in social Darwinism. It's the people who fight that are going to get ahead. That's the attitude. It's a very unhealthy culture. So you can't expect yourself to come out of that culture straight into the meditation without having to do some therapy, the Buddhist therapy. Learning to appreciate acts of generosity, learning how to appreciate virtue, learning how to appreciate the cultivation of skillful states of mind. This is why gratitude is one of the basic principles in developing the sense of delight in developing and delight in abandoning. You think of the good that other people have done for you. You realize they went out of their way. That your very life depends on the help of other people. And even though they may not have been perfect, in fact, this very unlikely that anybody that, who has helped you is perfect. 
but you learn how to appreciate their good actions. This is something we really have to give special value to. We can appreciate things, and there's a problem in our culture where they start talking about having gratitude to things, which misses the whole point, which is you want to be grateful to the actions so that you are stirred to do the kinds of actions that abandon unskillfulness and excuse me, abandon unskillfulness and develop skillfulness in its place. So as we practice, we have to sort out what we've picked up from our culture, our family, the media, schools, teachers. And ask ourselves, which things do we want to carry into the practice? Which things can you actually take as part of the, the training? Which part, things do you have to put aside? Realizing that you can't totally blame them. Because after all, your mind was an active mind. It picked up things around it. You find people living in very similar environments, but picking up different things from the environments. The question is not who's at fault, simply that you've got this stuff hanging in your mind, directing the way the mind feeds, directing the way it acts. And the saving grace is that the mind really does want happiness. And if it sees that these habits that it has are not leading to happiness, and that there are alternatives, that's where the mind is, is trainable. It's not a machine. It learns, if it's willing to learn usually running into suffering, running into stress. Those are the things that finally force us to learn. So even though the teaching on merit is one that we tend to overlook or push off to the side here in the West, it's something we really, really ought to bring back to center stage. It teaches us to appreciate the goodness of the mind, the goodness of the heart and to look for happiness in the actions of doing good, being generous in whatever way we're capable of. It doesn't have to mean material things. You can be generous with your, your knowledge, generous with your time, generous with your energy, generous with your forgiveness. The act of being generous in this way is a kind of happiness. The same with virtue. You want to learn how to appreciate restraint. Be grateful for it in other people. Appreciate its value in your own life. And when you're able to restrain yourself from doing something that you know is harmful, appreciate that. We suffer from that old Christian principle that when you do good, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's not the Buddhist approach at all. You've got to appreciate your goodness so that you keep on doing it, so you feel the desire to continue, to take delight in continuing to do it. That's part of the culture of the noble ones. And then when you bring these at attitudes into the practice, you find the practice goes a lot more easily. Because again, you know, this is a doing that we're doing here. working on developing skills. And we've got this opportunity to do it. Take delight in that. Even if it's not going well, if you're finding that it takes more time, more energy, more effort than you might have thought, or the results aren't coming as fast as you'd like. But still, you've got the opportunity to sit here and do something that's really good. That in and of itself is a form of happiness. Learn how to appreciate it, because that will give you the energy to stick with it. To try to figure things out. What's going wrong? Why am I having trouble here? 
can I catch myself doing something unskillful without any recrimination, just part of the, saying, oh, I do that. I don't have to do that. Let's try it something else, try something other way. And that's how the Buddha found awakening. He noticed what he was doing. He said, well, this isn't working. Could there be another way? How about if I did this? And he took joy in the action, joy in the fact that he had choices, joy in the fact that he was able to test things. That's the delight in developing, the delight in abandoning. We have this opportunity to act, to shape our experience, make the most of it, try to find delight in doing it well. <laughs>